This is Dr. Robert Gish. Greetings and welcome to the CME CE certified activity titled Integrating the Latest Advances into Clinical Practice, Data and Expert Insights from the 2016 meeting on gastrointestinal cancers in San Francisco. This educational activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine and Access Medical Education and is supported by educational grants from Novartis Pharmaceuticals, Taiho Oncology, Inc., and Lilly. My name is Dr. Robert Gish. I'm a clinical consultant professor of medicine at Stanford Hospital and Medical Center in Stanford, California, senior medical director at the UNO Certified Liver Transplant Program at St. Joe's Hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, and a clinical adjunct professor of medicine at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. My disclosures include consulting fees and Speakers Bureau from Bayer Pharmaceuticals Corporation. Our discussion today will include the most exciting and compelling data concerning hepatocellular carcinoma from the 2016 gastrointestinal cancers meeting and insights on how these clinical advances may be practice changing. So let's begin. The first study I'd like to highlight is a study concerning doxorubicin and serafinib. Now let's step back in history just a short time. A phase two study was published in JAMA by Dr. Abu Alpha in 2010 that compared doxorubicin plus serafinib versus doxorubicin alone. As you recall, in this small study of about 100 patients, the median overall survival was doubled from 6.5 months to 13.7 months. This led to justification to develop a much larger phase three study to determine if doxorubicin still had a role in managing our patients. Doxorubicin historically was used as monotherapy intravenously for about two decades to manage HCC, though both in the U.S. and worldwide. And interestingly, for a time, was the only medication that was a systemic therapy for liver cancer. The data to support doxorubicin has been scant in the peer-reviewed medical literature. Abstract 192 from Dr. Abu Alpha, entitled Serafinib with Doxorubicin, the results of a phase three trial. Overall, adding doxorubicin did not appear to benefit serafinib therapy in patients with advanced HCC. Now let's take a look at the data in a little bit more detail. Median overall survival was 9.3 months for the combination therapy compared to 10.5 months for serafinib alone. It's important to note that this crossed a threshold of futility and the DSMB halted this study with an enrollment in the range of around 350 patients. Additionally, about 38% of patients receiving doxorubicin plus serafinib had grade three or four hematologic adverse events compared to just 8% of patients reach, uh, receiving serafinib alone compared with 8.1% of those patients receiving serafinib alone. This may be the end of the use of doxorubicin for HCC, but I'll comment on that just a little bit later in this podcast. Now, we're going to give a little bit of background on an important medication called Tevantinib. This is an experimental anti-cancer drug that was developed to target MET. It was determined to be a highly selective MET inhibitor, but the mechanism of action is still unclear with tevatinib and may involve other mechanisms since tevatinib displays cytotoxicity activity via molecular mechanisms that are independent of its binding to MET. Now let's just go back in history also just for a short period. Santoro in Lancet Oncology 2013 looked at the treatment of patients with liver cancer high MET in tissue, and tevatinib in this phase two study compared to placebo had an overall survival of 7.2 months compared to 3.8 months for placebo alone. This is an important determination. This led to tevatinib being developed 
and moved into phase three studies. But let's look at this data in a little bit more detail in abstract 197 from Ramasa. They did a number of very important analyses with data extracted from the phase two randomized clinical trial, and they found some important findings. Now, we already know that alpha-beta protein is a risk marker for future liver cancer development. But if you have liver cancer, alpha-beta protein helps with current prognosis. Chance of progression, is it poorly differentiated? Chance of recurrence? And like AFP in this tibatinib study, high MET, like high AFP, indicated a much shorter survival in the tibatinib study, both in tibatinib and in placebo. Now, another important finding was is that circulating MET increased over time with serafinib exposure. So something's happening with serafinib, and this may explain serafinib resistance in that as MET increases, this may be another pathway for tumor uh, replication and maybe an escape route that allows the tumor to uh, bypass where serafinib inhibits through the RAF-RAS uh, kinase pathway. Now, another important finding in this study is that patients on tibatinib with greater than a 10% reduction in circulating MET had an overall survival of 13.3 months compared to those who did not have a 10% reduction at 6.3 months. So circulating biomarkers, tissue biomarkers, may all be important not in just this specific medication, but with other medications that are being developed for liver cancer. More to come on biomarkers and guiding therapy. Now we're going to move to a different subject, PD-1, PD-L1, extremely hot topics in oncology today. This protein death receptor or protein death ligand is very involved in immune control not just immune control of cancer, but also immune control of things like viral hepatitis, including hepatitis B, where exploratory studies are ongoing today. But if you inhibit this receptor or this axis in different types of cancer, you de-repress the immune system, and as you move up immune activity, an anti-cancer effect takes place in different types of tumors, such as lung cancer. Now, this is being explored in liver cancer, because in the liver, there are Cooper cells, which express PD-1, which may have anti-tumor activity, tumor-associated monocytes as well. And if you can activate the immune system, you may have another pathway alone or in combination to battle hepatocellular carcinoma. And this has been proven in marine models. Now, from a historical perspective, at ASCO 2015, El-Curry et al. had a study phase one, two of 47 patients looking at blocking PD-1 with nivolumab. Now, these were child's A patients, but with advanced disease, typically with portal vein thrombosis or metastatic disease outside the liver. 70% approximately of these patients had been previously treated with serafinib. In this study, overall survival was 62% at 12 months. An expected survival, even in treated individuals with serafinib monotherapy, would have been 30% in a similar patient profile. This has led to further explorations in using PD-1 inhibitors or PD-L1 inhibitors moving towards phase three trials. But now we're going to talk about, is that really justified? In abstract 289, Modi took a look at PD-1 and PD-L1 expression and molecular associations in various hepatobiliary tumors. Now, what was interesting here is that 4 to 18 percent of the hepatobiliary tumors express PD-L1, and 29 to 45 percent of these tumors express PD-1. Now, as we develop these clinical trials, the question is there is should we be guiding therapy in the clinical trials based on PD-L1 or PD-1 expression? Should we also subselect patients or randomize patients selective and select those patients' randomization based on this expression? We know that there's an extreme tumor heterogeneity with different gene expressions, receptor expressions, kinase expressions, and we just talked about MET expressions a few moments ago 
with one of the other studies that was here. So this is something that will need to be looked at prospectively. Now, interestingly, in this tissue analysis, there were no specific mutations in the tumors that were associated with PD-1 positivity or negativity. But there was an increase in top 2A, topoisomerase 2A expression, which is a marker of both cellular proliferation, proliferation of cellular proliferation and, interestingly, anthracycline sensitivity. So it's possible that doxorubicin is not dead, but may come back in another form in patients that may have PDL1 expression. So important studies, tissue analyses, determining tissue heterogeneity, how to design future studies, and ultimately, should we be doing tissue biopsies on all of our liver cancer patients? Are liquid biopsies enough? Are circulating tumor markers sufficient? All of these will be looked at in current and developing prospective studies, especially the large phase three studies, which will help us probably the most. Now let's look at another important area. Historically in managing liver cancer, external beam radiation therapy has had a very small role. Maybe one to three percent of patients actually make it to the radiation oncologist. I, as a practicing hepatologist, who have taken care of a few thousand liver cancer patients, have really rarely seen a role for radiation therapy. Now, there's been huge improvements in how we guide radiotherapy for our patients. And SBRT, the stereotactic body radiotherapy, has really matured for a variety of different tumors. And it's being looked, again, closely for patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, specifically unresectable. Abstract 322 by Young took a look at a large population and looked at what would be the tumor response. Now, overall response with SBRT for all patients in the study at one year was 67% and 62% at two years. Very interesting, even some patients with large tumors. Progression-free survival, 53% and 38% respectively at one and two years. The median PFS was 13.7 months, with 13 patients, 27% of the total, undergoing further treatment. Four of those patients eventually underwent liver transplantation. In summary, SBRT provided high levels of local control for patients with HCC with moderate to large sized tumors. Clearly would be another option to add to our near-term armamentarium for patients with HCC Though large randomized controlled studies would be ideal. A little bit more information from this SBRT study. Overall, again, I'd like to highlight that this is a retrospective study of 49 HCC patients that were looked at between 2011 and 2015 at the British Columbia Cancer Agency. Now, natural history is very important. Natural history of HCC was looked at in abstract 416 by Al Shamsi. Now, as you recall, we don't use the TNM system very commonly for HCC. We're typically very much focused on BCLC in clinical practice. But this study looks specifically at T1 lesions, which is less than two centimeters, N0, M0. This is a large scale US study, and they highlighted what we know. 20% five-year survival rate. We need to do much better than this. If you take a look at a similar group of patients in Japan and follow them out five to 10 years, you're gonna see survival rates in the 50 plus percent range. Now, this is a correction even for length and lead time bias. And the determination is, is that finding lesions at small size and intervening with potentially curative therapies, including resection, liver transplant, but as you recall, re ablative therapy in these small tumors, especially percutaneous RFA and microwave ablation, can result in cure in a significant, I'm saying small but significant at 20% range number of patients. Now in this study, two things were very important. Surgery numerically had the best overall survival, but serafinib 
had good long-term survival rates that were numerically similar to the surgical resected populations. Clearly we're going to be re, re, clearly we're going to be selecting different patients for surgery versus serafinib, but these overall survival data with serafinib was quite impressive. Now the most important thing from this study to me is that 50% of the HCC patients were non-viral, both non-alcohol and non-viral. This to me supports at least the theory that fatty liver in NASH is emerging as potentially as the first or second most common cause of HCC in the United States. So, in summary, the role of SBRT is in evolution. Larger con controlled studies will help us define the role of SBRT in patient selection. Doxorubicin is at least temporarily closed as a single or combination therapy for HCC that reemerge in the future in patients who appear to have some type of selective sensitivity. PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors are being explored in detail, and tissue and liquid biomarkers of PD-1 and PD-L1, quote, sensitivity, end quote, will be important to help determine who should undergo therapy with these specific inhibitors. The Tavantinib studies have helped us define both tissue and serum biomarkers that may be helpful in guiding not just this specific medication, but also other medications in the future. We are shifting back to both a tissue biopsy frame in managing HCC patients, and hopefully we will be able to detect and use tools of blood markers for HCC management. And with that, we'll conclude this educational activity, and thank you for your participation.